Good evening. Well, welcome to the March 13, 2023 meeting of the Board of Selectmen. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This meeting is being conducted in person and remotely over Zoom. We are recording the meeting. Is there anyone else recording? Okay. Seeing none, first order of business are minutes of February 13th and February 27th. Pam, under uh, police, police budget, okay. Detective Roth, his name needs to be fixed. Yeah, it's just it's not spelt right. <clears throat> okay, and on page three, our Scanic Valley Water, PFAS, PFAS. PFAS. Yeah. PFAS. Yeah. PF, PFAS. And just for, I think, consistency, whenever you have ARPA, just capitalize the whole thing if you could. I would do a search and replace. <clears throat> Had to get that Boston Post cane in there, huh? Mm hmm. Should have been a picture. How's the board feel? Uh, motion to approve February 13th with those changes. Second. All in favor? Okay. Aye. Aye. Okay, the minutes of February 27th. Fairly long meeting. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we got clerk. Obviously, the bulk of this was in reference to ambulance contract. Mm -hmm. Step by step. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lot. Right, I think for a point of clarity, anybody listening is that all these changes were summarized and signed by the board at the meeting last week. So uh, when we do see the minutes of March 6th, probably next week, uh, there will be a lot of clarity here. Obviously, a new 
fully executed copy of the contract will be available to be reviewed. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Pam, good job uh, summarizing a lot of, a lot of conversation. Our honored guest, and you went, and you went, Aaron, also. Yeah, me too, okay. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. Got an extra for over there, no. Any news on that? Yeah, does your mic work? Sure. Can we throw that down there? It does. Yes, I know, I tried to. Brand. Any news on the new ones? They're still unavailable. Yeah, oh, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I feel like it's like when you're on the price is right. <laughs> you need your answer, long, please. Like Bob Baco right? when he used to hold the long one. Yeah. We're going to talk about it. Right. Is the price right very soon? Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to welcome uh, our two school committee representatives, Michelle and Maura. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for having and us. Our superintendent, John, is this the first time you've been to our meeting or second, maybe? I think it's our second. 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 Yeah. second. And Aaron, the uh, brains behind the money. I thought I'd throw Some you. A, guy. I thought I'd throw you a bone before Don takes you to the woodshed. <laughs> Thank you. Not me. So I did ask. Did you have copies that I sent you an email asking for copies for our board? Do you have copies of the presentation we did? Whoops. Right. Sorry. Same as last week's, right? The finance committee. Do you need? Who needs copies? I do. Okay. Anyone else? I could use one there. There's a couple more than from last week. Be the same as the there's two, there's a couple of them. Yeah, what's your last one? He says there's a couple of them. Can I just see one of them? Sure. Just goes right to the assessment. Just sticker. Listen, we'll we'll happily give you a ream of paper from our town hall. Okay, thank you. Yeah, how much did this come out of the budget? Uh, you're imagining I'm not taking some on my way out. We had all those dead trees you could have borrowed. That's fine. Um, I think I did share with Michelle that. I did attend the roundtable meeting last week virtually. However, because of technical difficulties, uh, we were not able to participate as the microphones were muted. So we didn't hear anything that went on in your meeting okay. and we weren't able to make comments back. So that's why I asked for this, that you can come and ba basically do a re -pre repeat, refresh, <laughs> rinse, really explain to the board what went on at that meeting and then allow us to participate in a kind of a discussion on that. So tell us about sure. your budget. Happy to do that. Just to speak to that, that comment first, I would say that uh, the stream is much better on YouTube channel than it mm -hmm. is on Zoom. So folks who want to um, just listen to the meeting, I think watching it on the YouTube channel is, is much more effective. To listen to, correct. correct. However, since know, at the beginning, me and you assigned me as a, a co-host, and then I wasn't able to make any comment. I understand. You know, I understand. Happy right. to be here, but I just for folks that? at home, I just wanted them to know that they'll they can, get much much better experience on YouTube than on. How did you do that? That you couldn't make a comment at the meeting. We'd like to <laughs> know that technology. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're right here too. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> Note to Mark, don't plow his road. Thank you. Would you like me to, to walk through quickly the Please. presentation you gave? Please. So um, uh, the presentation starts talking a little bit about the five-year strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, this was a year-long process that I think a number of folks um, here and, and in the audience were part of. Um, and it's, it's been a long time in the making. I know this district has not had a strategic plan in something like 20 years. So, you know, finally resolving that lawsuit and getting those things behind us was an opportunity. With that said, um, there are costs, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we understood going in and, and coming out. Um, so the next slide talks about some of the, the three initiatives that we're looking to carry into the first year of the strategic plan. Uh, this number initially started out at $250,000. Um, uh, we've agreed to um, offset uh, one of the items um, uh, by digging a little bit into some ESSER uh, that's coming to an end. Um, 
and uh, cutting another item. So we're coming through about 100,000. Curriculum counselor, councils are a big part of aligning our curriculum uh, K to 12. Um, so we talk a lot about those gaps between the different schools, middle school, high school, elementary to middle school, and then we have also the, the sort of jumps that happen at the elementary level. Um, I think for those of you who've ever been on our website, um, it's challenging to say the least. Um, you know, the curriculum counselors are a pretty definitive cost. We, we know it's going to be about 25000 uh, Website update, we're guessing it's going to be about 25000 I've, I've redone a few websites in my time, and that tends to be about the number, give or take. Um, uh, and then we know there are going to be outcomes from our equity audit. So the school committee agreed to do an equity audit. We're doing it. The audit itself is being funded out of ESSER funds. Um, but the actual outcomes, we're just assuming there are going to be some things, and we're kind of guessing that um, we can do maybe 50,000 of the near one. And that, I, we don't know. That equity audit's already been completed, right? Uh, it's, it's underway. It's underway. It's already been paid for then? In June. And that was that was out of ESSER grants and any yeah. any taxpayer funding, or is that strictly uh, out of ESSER grant funded, which is 100%. effectively taxpayer funded in the long run, but yeah. uh, we agreed to fund the actual audit process itself. What that was that cost? Hmm? And what was that cost? That came to one hundred nineteen thousand five hundred dollars, a little more than we expected. But... <clears throat> so we thought we'd then go into talking a little bit about assessments, um, what our history has been as a district. Can, can excuse me, Aaron? Can I, can I go back? The the equity audit outcomes, like, give me a, an idea, like what what might be a hypothetical. So, for example, I think one thing that likely to come out of the equity audit is there are some services that not all students can access due to their financial need. So we may have to create some kind of a structure within the district to make some programs more accessible to all. Athletics, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, assessment history next. Um, if, you, if you look at the next slide, um, our overall assessments over the past uh, five years or so have averaged 2.29% uh, with a low in 2021 of 1.04%. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about sort of what that means relative to you know, our, our competitiveness with other districts a little later. Um, one of the, the things that's important to recognize when you compare us to, say, a Long Meadow or at least East Long Meadow, these questions keep coming up. Why is Long Meadow's budget so much lower than yours? Um, we bear these additional costs plus the cost to administer them. Many of these costs go up significantly. These are some of the, the higher if, within the town. You probably see this. Um, things like health insurance, retirement contributions, retiree health insurance, things like that, are the things that go up significantly year after year. You know, our salaries will hover in the two to two and a half percent range. Some of these items are retiree um, retirement contributions. Last year went up by nine and a quarter percent. This year they're going up by more than 5%, and that's on about $2.2 million. So those are some pretty significant costs. If we were Long Meadow or, or East Long Meadow, the town would be bearing those costs. We are bearing those costs ourselves. Um, we are the one item that we actually came out fairly solidly in this year um, was uh, health insurance. So our health insurance and retiree health insurance, um, Scantic Valley, I, I went in kind of ready to fight and, and told them that I needed the lowest number possible given some of the other items you'll see. Uh, and they agreed to keep it at 2%. Um, so our, our health insurance is, is held at 2%. Uh, school choice out and charter school out, workers' comp, unemployment, Medicare, and then all the costs to administer all of that are things that are typically built within a, uh, a regional budget, but that a municipal budget like the Long Meadow doesn't pay. Or, you know, I'm using Long Meadow because they're right there and we're usually compared with them. So one of the ways we are comparing ourselves going forward is looking at um, comparable districts. And the next slide talks a little bit 
about Desi, Desi's DART system. Desi takes and um, creates groupings, cohorts of comparable districts, districts that are relatively social, socioeconomically similar and have similar, say, low income, similar uh, special education populations, ELL populations. And so one of the things that, that John has sort of tasked us with going forward is looking at this cohort and seeing how we, we stand up against these, this cohort. So I thought I'd look at other regional districts within um, our cohort. So if you look at the next slide, that talks a little bit about three-year average assessments. Um, so if you look at Dighton Rehoboth, Freetown Lakeville, uh, Whitman Hanson, uh, they have significantly um, higher assessments than we do. Keep in mind, we struggle from a lack of Chapter 70 funding, right? We talk about being in hold harmless. Assessments come about after you take Chapter 70 out. So, so these districts aren't benefiting in this from more Chapter 70. This is truly what the towns are bearing. Um, I'm not doing this, you know, to try to you know, shame our towns. I'm doing this to try to just offer some comparisons, right? If you were to take and look at the price of a Big Mac in Dighton versus the cost of a Big Mac in maybe not Hamden. I don't think you have a McDonald's in Hamden. But in a nearby <laughs> town, you'd see those costs are fairly similar, right? The cost to run a school district can be seen as somewhat comparable, right? It's not purely apples to apples. There are differences. But by and large, you know, the same cost impacts impact them as impact us. So the next couple of slides speak to a little bit of what we're looking at. Um, I want to say we haven't, you know, drawn conclusions but about, from this, but we're talking about these items in terms of how we structure ourselves. So if you look at the next item, teachers per hundred <coughs> students, we're actually a little lower than some of the other districts in our cohort as well as the state. And that prompts us, particularly when we look at the next slide of our paraprofessional use, we seem to use more paraprofessionals per 100 students than our cohort or the state. And that just prompts us to ask some questions. It doesn't mean we would be prone to cutting e either of those immediately, but maybe looking at the mix and what the best mix of teachers to paraprofessionals is as we move forward. So is that good or bad? Hmm? Is that good or bad? Less um, teachers, more right parent now, officials, or does it make a difference? I think it's it's somewhat neutral right now in terms of costs, um, but it does prompt us to ask, how are we best aligned to serve students' needs? And is it better to maybe have a few more teachers and fewer paraprofessionals in the long run? So this isn't going to lead to the immediate elimination of paraprofessional jobs, but it's just causing us to rethink our structure a little bit. I got a couple questions about these graphs before we go forward. And sure. They're probably just going to come out in random orders. So yeah. feel free to answer them in any which way. Okay, go ahead. But um, the biggest thing I'm noticing here between the cohorts is what you're pointing out is Hamden seems to Hamden Wilbraham seems to have the highest special needs student Correct. base. So I was going back to this one here, and you were referencing low income. So my, my two part question to that: What's classified as low income? Mm -hmm. And of those low income population that you're Second yep. out here, um, how many of them are at a district school choice students? Um, I I couldn't tell you what what proportion. I think our um, John, you've been looking at some of our school choice students and mm -hmm. how they match up. Um, uh, I know uh, performance wise, um, we've actually seen them to be relatively comparable. Um, I. I don't have actual numbers, and we can look those numbers up on low income for um, out of district students. Yeah. School I was just kind of curious because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm probably skipping ahead now on you, but you know, I saw the, the low income percentage yeah. increase to 58% or 23% yep. from 5%, like what, 10 years ago, yeah. roughly? So, yes. I was, and then, but I know every year we've always gradually brought in more and more out of district students. Mm -hmm. So, I was wondering how much of that percentage is becoming from those transfers in. Sure. And then I'm going to dovetail into some other question now, and I'm throwing a lot at you right now. Yeah. Um, what is the cost per student for general education as opposed to the cost per student for special education? <clears throat> and where is that cutoff coming from in the state? Are we, are we overextending ourselves by bringing in more students? Um, so in terms of 
for school choice students, um, we, we receive money for their special education needs. So if there is a, right. a, a school choice student who comes in, we charge back their home district for their needs. So we're typically made fairly whole on that. In some cases, some of those students, we get money for them and they are another potato in the pot in some ways, if you think of it in that way. Um, school choice in general, is, is seen very much the way the airlines see it, right? So if you have a flight that's three quarters full and you have an opportunity to fill that flight and you can take in a little bit of money to fill that flight, you're better off filling that flight if you can. It doesn't change the, the general cost of flying the plane. Uh, we're very similar. We have a lot of fixed costs. We have you know large school buildings, we have heat, um, you know electricity, things like that that are gonna be there no matter whether we have choice students or not. Um, a, a special education student, um, it's hard to say, I don't, I don't know the specific cost per special education student. Um, circuit breaker doesn't kick in until we go to four times um, our foundation enrollment with number, which is about $50,000, it's just shy, shy of 50,000. Most of our students fall under that, but I think it's safe to say that they could be anywhere in the you know, typically twenty to forty thousand dollar range per student. It, it can get <coughs> some 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 items are mixed. Some are um, uh, you know our ability to keep students in district sometimes versus out of district. So there are some dynamics in this that we want to look mm -hmm. at. Yeah. So I guess I'm just wondering <coughs> if our you know the cost per student yeah. coming in, mm -hmm. are we losing money by bringing in more students? by bringing in choice students yeah. as a whole. Sure, so uh, you're never in a situation where you can lose money for bringing in choice students. So the question that you can ask is, would it be more efficient to reduce your staff as opposed to bringing in choice students? Um, the way that I've always sort of looked at that is you don't want to create new classes um, for choice students, or you don't want to use choice to prop up classes that would otherwise be closed. So we're not in that position with, with any of our choice students, so I think okay. we're good with respect to that. Um, I did want to speak a little bit to the question you asked about the trends in low income. Yeah. I think uh, looking at the context here is helpful. If you look at what's happened statewide, if you look at what's happened in uh, East Long Meadow, our Which neighboring page are we on community. Right now? I'm sorry, nine. that's page nine, it's the table yeah, at the top. You. Yeah. you can see what's happening is, in general, there are more young people in our schools who are facing economic need across the Commonwealth. Um, I don't really think that's an, uh, a unique story in our district or it's an aberration caused by choice. In fact, um, one of the things that happens with choice, it's sort of a critique of choice, is Students who can participate tend to be the highest socioeconomic group within their district. You know, no transportation is provided, so they have to be able to get themselves over here. Um, so I think what the driver there really is the economic conditions in the state and the fact that we have more and more families of, of young children um, living in <coughs> conditions that would be considered low income. Um, the definition has changed a couple of times over the context of this, which might have con contributed a little bit. Um, if you see, maybe hard to see here, but there are actually three different colors yeah. because there were three different definitions of low income over the course of this. And you can see there were sort of bumps at each time the, um, the definition was changed. Um, so right now, just to essentially thumbnail what the current um, definition of low income is, it means that the student is eligible for free or reduced lunch, which is a federal um, definition based on the percentage of the poverty level that you're living at, or you're eligible for any state or federal assistance program, which is um, captured through what they call direct certification. So to a certain extent, I think direct certification may have helped to drive up the numbers too, because um, at one time you had to actually have families come forward and sign up for free or reduced lunch, especially at the secondary level. Oftentimes families were reluctant to do that. But now, um, because we can identify students through direct certification, if they're participating in any other program, I think we're getting a truer picture of what the need of the community is. is it, Thank is you. It, is it safe to assume that some of the drop in the numbers from like, two, I mean, the increase in numbers between 2019 
20 and 21, um, thinking about COVID and the number of people who lost their jobs during that time period. And, you know, people who lost jobs, maybe not for getting vaccinated. I'm not trying to make it a political thing, but there was a, a larger number of people who may have lost their jobs. So then that not having that income to report would then show a higher rate. I think that income. I think that's a very um, strong hypothesis, especially since you see that that was reflected across the board in all of these comparison districts in the yeah. state. Aaron, or John, I'm interested in what's happening with the choice out mm -hmm. and charter school out, number sure. one. And number two, when do you expect some of the revenue, the new revenue from the tax increase last fall to be plugged in? Sure. Um, <laughs> good questions. Um, so are you increasing or decreasing choice out students? Um, choice out has actually been relatively stable. Choice and charter has actually been relatively stable. The bigger challenge um, for choice out is that there are, are virtual choice options. So we have a mass virtual academy and we have um, HECA Academy, which are the two state allowed um, uh, virtual schools of choice. We had a lot of students join those during COVID mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're staying in them for the most part, um, but they are wind, seem to be winding down very slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is the state um, has allowed them a four and a half percent cost increase um, this year um, and uh, in, in allows them cost increases every year. And so where we only get $5,000 in choice, they're getting uh, almost $9,000 in choice dollars. Uh, they have no transportation costs. They have no building. Uh, they have no school lunch program. Uh, they, they utilize much higher um, student teacher ratios um, to do that. Mm -hmm. So their cost structure is very different from ours. And the state has <coughs> given them a four and a half percent increase uh, to their costs. So while our choice has maybe ticked down a small bit, uh, the actual cost has gone up a little bit. Um, both choice and charter actually stayed pretty consistent. Um, we did have um, a, a larger number of charter out students during COVID as well. So almost the inverse, there were more charter schools in full in person than we were. So the parent, some parents wanted their kids to be fully virtual. Some parents wanted their students to be fully in person. Yep. So some of those charter schools that were, were more fully in person attracted some of those students. So it was a bit of a no-win scenario one way or the other. We were going to get hit. I think there were even some charter schools that had more virtual, fully virtual options. Um, they have a lot more leeway than we do. Um, but on a, on a good note, the, that number is actually a little more stable even than our choice. So we're, we're OK on those two. Aaron, the, the chart that was back on page two, the assessment increase history. Yep. So that's historically what we've been seeing for an increase? Yes. And then contrast that with page six, where just the salaries alone mm -hmm. are more than the increase we've seen in any of the past five years. Is that assessment once, is that for both towns or just one? Mm -hmm. The, the assessment, that's a combined assessment for the two towns. Okay. Yeah. So we've never had a million dollar assessment for both towns, but just this year alone, salaries went up over a million dollars? It's been, it's been in the $900,000 plus range a couple of years. We've, we've done a couple of things to keep the net down. Mm -hmm. We've had the past few years, um, so we're going to talk a lot about, in a minute, special education costs. Mm -hmm. um, the district has done a fairly good job of ratcheting down some of the special education costs. So over the past few years, we're, we're decreasing those numbers a little bit. Um, and it's offset a few things. We've had a couple other items to the positive. I think the past few years, you've seen me talk about things that were to the positive, as many mm -hmm. things to the positive as were to the negative. This year, just everything is piling on top. So it, that salary number looks it, true to what it is. It's, it's been, you know, we've had some saving graces in past years um, in other areas. So I think we were, if you look at last year, we were 900,000 in salary increases at least.
increased. But the assessment only went up 800 because you're able to depress the we assessment using other funds. Like the ESSER yeah. grant, right? Yeah. Okay. Through the ESSER. Okay. Mm -hmm. This year we're just getting hit harder by everything. It's What's your E and D at this point? Uh, we're a little over uh, about 1.5 million. We very intentionally took it down mm -hmm. um, last this past year. Um, and we withheld some ESSER funds, so mm -hmm. we have we have very significant ESSER funds that we're putting into the budget this year and next year. Mm -hmm. So our hope is over this year and next year, we will ratchet that END number back up and have a decent balance to be able to. So we're hoping to get it you know back up over two million dollars. But you don't think there's going to be funds available that would normally go into END at the end of the fiscal year that could be used to offset some of next year's school budget increases as you've done in prior years? Not, I mean, not beyond sort of that 1.5 million. Our, our, again, our hope is to, to responsibly use our ESSER funds mm -hmm. in place of some, basically some END and, and bring that END up. So the END lasts mm -hmm. longer. ESSER will be gone at the end of next year. Mm -hmm. So we would rather put that, put more money in END <coughs> than that then, then use the E and D and, and, and lose the ESSER as well, right. right? So we're trying to be as responsible as possible. It's kind of that balance of, um, I call it fungibility of funds, right. is E and D is much more fungible in the long term mm -hmm. than um, ESSER is. ESSER for the short term was very fungible, which just means usable, right, in, in a financial sense. Is that fair? So, um, you know, as we go back to kind of getting into this, the sort of schedule of things, you know, one of the areas, um, you know, I think that we're, we're constantly challenged on is leadership um, and an overhead. So page five, slide 10, um, if you compare us to the state, you compare us to other districts in our region. Um, you know, we're tied with kind of Freetown Lakeville at, at the bottom. And, and when you look at district-wide admin, um, mm -hmm. we're definitely well below everyone else. Um, and we're, you know, I, I want to be clear, we're not looking to add to that. I think we're just trying to underscore that I don't believe that we're woefully top-heavy when we have these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but much to the point we had before, the next slide, when we look at student support staff, Right, and you look at special education, this is a place where we're well above um, some of our benchmarks. We're equal to the state, but on the special education side, we're much higher than other districts. So what are, what are they doing that we're not doing? Um, and how could we look at doing things differently if they're, if they're doing that more efficiently than we are? So those are some areas we'd want to look at. So then when we get into, these are our budget increases. Um, the next slide about, 2.5 million. John and I have been um, back and forth with Lower Pioneer Valley, um, and we're looking at possibly moving to a three-tier transportation system, which would save us about $200,000. Um, Can you so, explain what that means? Hmm? Can you explain what that so means? So that would mean that right now we have um, our two-tier system means we do Green Meadows, the elementary in one route, then middle school, high school in route two. We would have three. So what what happens is that the cost of simply putting a bus on the road is is the biggest factor. I don't know if your parents ever told you, you know, the second you turn the lights on, mm -hmm. right, um, you know, you, you waste ten cents or something. That's the minute you put a bus on the road. You're getting a driver. You're you're putting fuel in it. You've got maintenance costs. Mm -hmm. So if we can be more efficient about our buses and we have the bus for the day, we'd just be paying a little bit more hourly cost per bus, mm -hmm. but fewer buses. Um, we would we would split the district right. into three separate routes. Um, we're looking at what that would look like. There's a couple different permutations, so I don't want to, you know, sort of share all those now, but. You know, they, they, they offer different sort of combinations of schools that would be served by each route. Would it, and I don't even know if it's possible. I'm, mm -hmm. I know we have to offer a seat for every student because of a regional program. But, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I go over Green Meadows in the afternoon, <laughs> three quarters of the school does pick up. Mm -hmm. So we know we're underutilizing the buses. Now, would it, is there a way to roll the, the, the smaller buses? 
So the, the, to bring the seat space down? Yeah. And does that cost it, less? It's really almost better to do fewer buses right. than, than smaller buses. The, okay. the smaller buses use almost as much gas and almost, and they, they require a person. The biggest cost is that person, mm -hmm. right, if they're up front. Um, we, yeah, we, we are absolutely having those costs. So I, I compared choice to the airlines. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think additionally the airlines prepare, they, they don't, you, you always hear about people getting bumped and what have you off of flights. They overbook flights, right? intentionally because they know a certain number of people aren't going to make their flight. Similarly, we know a certain number of people are getting dropped off, right? We can't have a situation where we don't have a seat for a child, but if we have buses that are constantly only two thirds full, I think we have to look at right sizing that and we can, can we cut busing down to where they're three quarters full, 80% full? Mm -hmm. What's the sweet spot where no kid is ever going to be standing by the side of the road and have the bus say, sorry, we're full. But we can sort of maximize that utilization. We are having conversations <coughs> with Lower Pioneer Valley where even if we were to keep with the current configuration, maybe we could cut a couple of buses. And uh, that's a state mandated thing because we have no control over We have to offer that seating. Yeah, mm -hmm. so because so, we're a regional school district. Right, right. right. So what, where is, I, I know we've talked about it at other roundtable meetings, is how can we get our funding back, that 100% funding that we were guaranteed? Not writing letters. <laughs> right, I know, I know I mean, when, when Jake like, was in the meeting, you know. But there's no, I mean, that we, we, we as a school district have always tried to get that funding back. That's part of the reason why we've, off, we've started mm -hmm. having the roundtable meetings because mm -hmm. the only way to let the, um, our, our representatives know is by them hearing it firsthand right. from us. Mm -hmm. But we're not the only ones encountering that issue either. Bob, so, and I, Bob and I attended the Chamber of Commerce Outlook luncheon last week hosted by the governor. And that was something that she did touch on in her remarks, mm -hmm. yep. especially coming back out here to Western Mass where you have a lot of regional school systems, is bringing that sense of fairness back to Western Mass. I believe she even opened an office um, north of here, Bob, correctly, because she wanted that type of interaction with out here. So hopefully between Jake, Angelo, Brian, those people will bring the message back that we think we've gotten short shrift <clears throat> As I think we've said, Don, every year. I know so you people as well. 90% reimbursement for regional transportation was one of the speaking points from the governor's budget. I will mm -hmm. point out, you might have noticed if you looked at the cherry sheets, um, it was kind of surprising <coughs> for us to receive the cherry sheet after that statement because our reimbursement actually went down. Um, so in terms of dollars, mm -hmm. so we we investigated to find out how can you increase the multiplier and no and increase the multiple can and end up with a lower product yeah. um, one of the things that we were told was that they're using a extremely conservative estimate at this point of what our costs are going to be so in the budget we did increase our anticipated reimbursement less uh, above what's in the cherry sheets um, so you don't see that anywhere but we are planning for that number to go up from where it is currently. So I, cal I calculated our, um, it's, gonna, it's based on what our 2023 is going to end up being, which is one of the reasons they're conservative. Um, but I took our 2022 numbers and I did sort of a 90% calculation. I submit that every year of their end of year report. Mm -hmm. um, and the number I have in sort of our assessment workbook is sort of midway between what the state sort of suggested and what my calculation was. So, you know, I think we're going to be in a good spot and hopefully that's somewhere, you know, it, it helps out a bit. And um, if it gets a little higher than what I put in, great, we put a little money into D&D, &D, right? We're hopeful to, to put some of that money back. Mm -hmm. um, the number two item, um, is it the number two item on that list? Give me a second, before I speak. Uh, yes, is out of district costs. Um, if you look at the very next slide, um, I spoke before about um, the state. So that's going to be the, the bottom of page six, top of page seven we're on right now. Mm -hmm. um, the operational services division of the state um, governs um, the cost of those virtual schools, as well as our private out of district placements for high need special education students. Mm -hmm. The operational services division gave a 14% across the board increase to all of our private out of district placements. So every one of those is going up 
by 14%. That comes to about $350,000 mm -hmm. um, of cost to us right. um, that we haven't had in the past. And um, that's you had no say in that. So no more, more mandates we have no yeah. control over. Right. Right. None, yeah. none. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we also, at some of these out-of-district placements, we have students who have one-to-one -one paraprofessional needs or specific needs. Mm -hmm. Those aren't governed by this 14%, and they can charge whatever they're going to charge for the most part. Mm -hmm. We've seen a couple of those go from $33,000 a year for a, a one-to-one -one paraprofessional to 43%, or mm -hmm. 43000 so almost a full third increase, 30% okay. increase to that. So this is one of the big challenging points in our budget. We have more in-district need because mm -hmm. we've got mm -hmm. students who are struggling, still very much struggling with coming out of COVID. Um, and I, I think regardless of, of where you fell on COVID, um, you know, you saw, you saw the children challenged by it one mm -hmm. way or the other, right? I, I don't think that, that that's political in any way or, right. or governed by any of what went on. Um, additionally, when we talk about utilities, hmm. um, we're looking at, I, I, I went with a 10% number. Um, there are many places going 25, 30% or more on utilities right now. I, I think we have um, some solar credits that we use. I think we can keep it to 10% this year. Um, we'll see where things go. I'm hopeful we can, we can keep it so that low. I think it would be Aaron, more challenging see. your current budget, wouldn't you, as opposed to next year's? I mean, uh, I don't know about that, but I will tell you if you look at the bill now, <laughs> The winter moratorium is over, so that it's come down. I want to say yeah. to eight percent, if not less than that. Yeah. That I mean, that's not just residential, but all the commercials have come down. Mm -hmm. So it isn't. I mean, I, I think we should take we a second look, look at that, that number. Sure. But I mean, in the current year, I mean, many of us have seen an enormous bump sure. in the past two or three months. Was that forecast in your last year's budget, no. or did it catch you? That's no, my point. Um, Are you caught by surprise, basically, in your current bills? The governor, when she is <clears throat> the attorney general, have proved a 300% increase for mm -hmm. um, utilities. And so that went, I may have the percentage wrong, but that's what drove such a high increase. Sure. But maybe a month into the winter numbers mm -hmm. and people not being able to pay their bills, mm -hmm. they had to try to do something. So they were trying to offset some of that. So we were a month to two months into the electric bills and they were starting to show mm -hmm. some credit base there. but. It was impacting larger industrial companies mm -hmm. as well as residents because you're taxing people who don't who are on a fixed income right. who can't pay for that. Mm -hmm. So now being out of the winter moratorium and now we're getting into spring, daylight you know, savings time. Right. You know, there should be less electricity being used. In terms of utilities, um, additionally, just to address the lighting issue at Minichog, I did not use this year's numbers or last year's numbers to project forward. I went back mm -hmm. to 2019, I looked at kilowatt hours, I, I uh, tried to uh, compare mm -hmm. how things look and ramp up appropriately so that despite the fact that we have, um, you know, a, a pretty big increase, you know, we expect Minichogs regardless to go down mm -hmm. and I'm budgeting for it to go down relatively speaking. Okay, quickly, uh, the, the comment in the paper, was it malware or was it not malware? I, I, I would know. say, I mean, uh, <laughs> the information I've received is that it was malware that corrupted the server mm -hmm. to the point where the server had to be replaced. Hmm. I, I had only heard corrupted throughout, and John was the one who told me that, that he heard it was malware. So I think there's a few different. Do so we have on staff IT or is it outsourced? So, so the, the server sat outside of our firewall. Mm -hmm. um, and so we didn't mm -hmm. control that. At the, the new system sits inside our firewall. So mm -hmm. we do have control over it. In the past, it was you know, up to the, the company. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there an IT person that facilitates all of HWRSD or is there is that all independent contracted? For, for Sir, us? For, uh, for yeah, yes, district we have IT staff. We, it used, we used to be a, BART. Is it still BART? We have a director of IT and we have a number okay. of building-based IT staff. So I guess where I'm going with that is that they know that it was infected with malware from the get-go. No, because it was outside of our <clears throat> firewall. We did not have control over it. So it wasn't something we could, we, we couldn't even, quite honestly, we couldn't even monitor it as much. And I'm not sure if it was from the get-go either. I think it might have become 
infected around the time that it stopped functioning properly. Do you know if we're going to get any kind of reimbursement from the company that holds the switch? I meant to ask you that earlier, and I, I apologize for being late to the finance I, and operations I meeting. I don't. And I, you know, if it's outside of our firewall, who's in charge of it, and why was it not rectified from them, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder why they couldn't just refresh the entire core and start from scratch. But that's why they had the issue with being able to shut the lights off in the building, because mm -hmm. we couldn't control outside of <clears throat> that. wasn't on us, meaning the district. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, our, our system was at, at 10 years old, the server and a lot of it was at end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it was, would have, you know, I think needed to be replaced fairly soon anyhow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know where we stand right now. So I, I guess I'll go into another question of concern. Mm -hmm. Do we have a capital needs for IT infrastructure that's on a, you know, like, like vehicles? Do we have, we have mm -hmm. a schedule that we yep. do every so many years. Mm -hmm. Were we out of that time frame? Were we not looking ahead for stuff like that? Or, or is that or, something that's coming out of this now? I, I, I can't, I mean, some of that kind of happened just as I was coming in, mm -hmm. the corruption of the, the malware. Um, you know, we do, when I arrived, there wasn't a formal capital plan looking forward. It was more or less mm -hmm. year to year. Um, we've added a 10 year capital plan and we're, we're building it up. It's not perfect, but we're doing our best to keep on top of that. So you'll see, in um, the assessments this year, a number of items yeah. that are technology related. We did the switches this year. Um, we will need to do wireless access points and things like that. I believe the year that Aaron uh, first joined, that was the year that the switches <clears throat> was brought up and brought to the school committee, brought to the town. Right. Um, but prior to the arrival of both of these gentlemen, the switches was never identified as an issue. But I don't know that we really had up until mm -hmm. COVID came, mm -hmm. we really had anything IT related that was huge other than like just trying to fund the one to one mm -hmm. um, computers. So, but before that, wouldn't you have like a annual computer replacement policy? You replace them a third of them every year or something like that as part of the budget. Year, I, I think it's more a, a replacing when we can. Mm -hmm. That's um, what was so you, you will recall um, a couple years <laughs> ago, I, I shared when, um, when we exceed our END threshold, mm -hmm. um, you know, I want to sort of share that we've done some items for the betterment of the district. Um, and so one of the things that, that that's something that had been, been done historically is when there was some excess funds mm -hmm. to do things like that. So a, a lot of what happens in schools is you get towards the end of the year. And if you do have some money, you refresh some computers. If you mm -hmm. don't have money, you plug along with what you've got. It, it's not really the best way to do things in my mind. Right, um, right now, we're focusing on the big things capital-wise, but we do absolutely need to drill down to the workstation level or the laptop level mm. and start working on a comprehensive sort of refreshment process that isn't just, well, we have some money at the end of the year, let's refresh the computers. But shouldn't this be part, I think, kind of where Craig was going, shouldn't this be part of the regular budget? Just like getting new books, like yes. getting new desks? It, it is now. Yes. It, is. it is now. Yeah, we're it, it came about just as when we hit COVID, like we knew that's when we identified that we were not putting enough money aside for that. Mm -hmm. So we made the commitment that we as a school committee wanted to have the as close to one-to-one, -one, if not one-to-one, -one, right. the availability. At, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, at the, the grade level it's not at the pre-k or it's the, the kindergarten high school yeah yeah but, but we, there's yeah. carts that they use that will make sure that that's yeah. um, right. funded to support well, that the elementary levels and the right, right now we're using esser for that we don't have a, an identified source for that yet okay so, so when, when i worked at atlas copco i was part of the refresh team yeah. and you know we had this spreadsheet of stuff that we always go through yeah. every year you know okay this person's coming up this person's coming yeah. up and we had you know, we had a time to lead. We knew who was coming up and, you know, not just computers, but, you know, higher end stuff too. And, that, and that's absolutely the next, and that was in the budget. That's absolutely the next proper step yeah. to move to now that we've kind of got the switches and some of the big stuff identified. Mm -hmm. I think we want to move down to how do we create a refresh cycle? Mm -hmm. The challenge is it's never existed as a budget mm -hmm. item. It's been a when we have the money. Mm -hmm. right. And so adding it into the budget this year in a challenging budget cycle is challenging. But then you have to ask yourself, well, when do we do it? When do we pull the Band-Aid off mm -hmm. and just do some of these things? So correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but I believe 
since that was not part of the budget mm -hmm. in an attempt to sort of put it on the radar screen without creating an aberration yep. i think you put that in the capital requests yes yeah, so it's it it's shown um so the chromebooks for students the one-to-one -one chromebooks i do have in our 10-year capital plan identified for the next couple of years it's covered by esser for for actually next year through next mm -hmm. year it's covered by esser after that, we don't have any source for that. It's sitting on the capital plan just so that we see it and it highlights it. It doesn't mean we're expecting mm -hmm. the towns to fund it, but we need to, by the, by the end of next year, we need to identify a source for that money if we want to keep a one-to-one -one program. And that doesn't address, to your point, the um, staff computers, right? Staff right. laptops, desktops, right. things like that. We've right. got you know, 400 staff running around Computers, we should be on a regular Rotation. refreshment cycle, right. and, and we're just we're just not. We don't have a, you know. I mean, we know which ones are ready and how old they mm -hmm. are. It's really a matter of when and where the money exists. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a hundred thousand dollars put aside every year for new computers, new printers. It's if you got a little left over, yeah. Joe gets a printer. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Quickly, one, one last thing well, before we get the capital thing. I see, obviously, you have an assessment increase here. I'm not quite sure if that's still where you are, if this number is changing daily, weekly, or whatever. You have conversations with Wilbraham as well. Uh, I'm sure they're <clears throat> more than eager to fund the 6% increase in their assessment. Why did the... This is a very minor number. I know you went out and I believe refloated the bond. Why did the regional debt assessment go up? Why what? Why did the uh, the debt number go so up? So it went down last year. It's right. going up very slightly. I thought it would keep it went down, down significantly last year. Right. Now it's just coming up in fluctuating rates. The rates were different, a little bit different. Oh, not lock. It's not a lock rate. Oh, it's locked. It it it. I think it varies a little bit year to year. Or last year we just got more savings in. Mm -hmm. by. It'll be consistent though. Okay. It's very, it, the, the, the increase should be. Oh, it's minor. I just, I was yeah. just surprised. Yeah. Yeah. You actually, last year was a pretty darn good savings yes. by refinancing. Yeah. 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 So where are you with Wilbraham in terms of what you've shown them as an increase? Um, so, I mean, we're, we're showing them this. This is where we're sitting right now, um, Wilbraham recently sent us an email, um, Nick Bro sent us an email that they've got uh, a million put aside for their assessment for this year. Obviously that's substantially less than where we are right now. Right. Um, you know, we're having, administration is having conversations about how we deal with that gap. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no, there's no easy way to get over that gap. Um, and uh, yeah, and I assume we're still at the roughly twenty percent to call, you know, yeah. 80, 80, 20 at this yeah. point. Yeah, within a one percent, whatever. Mm -hmm. So if they're offering a million, you're expecting two fifty from us. Yes, and which does not come close to the number you feel you need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So they were even in the meeting just before this one in our finance and operations subcommittee meeting. You know, then there was that back and forth of like, is that the number that you can do? Is there, you know, mm -hmm. kind of asking if they'd be even be more available. Um, but there, the concern is that they may be available a little bit more money available for the um, based on the assessment number. But then that may mean that may, they'd have to figure out a different way to fund capital plan. Mm -hmm. You know, the capital assessment stuff mm -hmm. or just Minichog, not, and that's not even accounting for any of the schools in Wilbraham that might need something. Right. So these capital needs are in addition to the assessment? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, these are not included in your number? They're not included no. in your number. Because no. they the way that they would do items. it, I think Bill had explained is they would become separate potential separate line items. We were asked to make them separate line items. So when you had the warrants, it'd be an item for the warrant and the town could vote if they wanted to, I guess. Yeah. Right. We saw they do An article in the paper that, but it didn't seem so. very definitive. Um, so that's why I think it's best to have this type of conversation. What are you hoping to get from the board of selectmen in the warrant? You know, we had a placeholder for potential school override request capital, whatever you want to call it. 
No, call it anything you want, whether it's capital request or something like that. That's the paper house. The paper was doing it, yeah. Yeah. The things you have for capital needs, and this is me speaking personally, you sent us a letter about the railings. You said in the letter that you had a Minichog stabilization fund that you felt that might be appropriate, but you want to know, could we give you some ARPA money to pay for it? Yeah. We said no. Mm -hmm. That's why you have a stabilization or capitalization fund. Mm -hmm. And then it shows up here on this list. Yeah. What happened to the plan you expressed in the letter? So it has always been here. The suggestion was to get this done sooner rather than later. There are some people who have more imminent concerns about this, who, who are concerned about the potential liability um, if something <coughs> were to happen again with that railing. Um, so there was a push to move it forward. Oh, was that again, something happened? Hmm. We, had, we had an incident um, a year and a half ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you want to move it forward, you have money in a current capital fund yes. for Minichog improvements. Yes, so we, we brought it forward to school committee, school committee uh, to come from the Minichog capital stabilization so we could get it done in a more timely right. manner. The school committee recommended we go to the towns. Um, so this, you know, if, if the school committee wishes to now take this out of the Minichog staff, capital stabilization fund they can. So perhaps it's, that letter predated going to the school committee and that's why we were, I want to say misled, but we were thinking that that was the two choices when we saw the letter, Don, you recall the letter. It, wasn't it seemed like, to mislead you. no, no, no. It, it seemed like the choices before us at that point yeah. were, oh my gosh, we have the current fund or could you give us ARPA money? I think it started with asking for ARPA though, because we knew that both towns based off of the finance and operations meetings that we have that mm -hmm. include, you know, Hamden Advisory and Wilbraham Finance. Right. That was why the, the ask was there. I don't think that we never, we ever thought that we couldn't use the stabilization money for that. Right. I know that one of the things that they had, that's been a huge um, bone of contention was how, how we were going to define the use of that money because mm -hmm. it is horribly mm -hmm. underfunded for mm -hmm. what the expectation that the community right. has felt that we should be putting for money in there. But with that comes, okay, so if we're gonna fund it, what vehicle do we use for that? Because then mm -hmm. you have to take that money from something else, you know, forward facing mm -hmm. students and education right. to put money mm -hmm. to build that account up. Because mm -hmm. I think was the estimate was like we're like about a million to two million dollars short. No, it's, or every it year be, we should be putting should that be in there. About two million a year. Right. Yeah. So So and that that's I think that's all. apparently there's money on trees somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And that I think brings us to the, the last part of that meeting that you weren't able to really hear. What one of the um, agenda items was to discuss what is the appropriate use of the stabilization fund for Minichog. We had some people who were actually present for the creation of that stabilization mm -hmm. fund to advise us on it. And they said what I got out of that meeting was that it really wasn't to conduct projects because as we were saying, it's not funded to that extent. What it was really meant to do is fund the feasibility studies that you would need for any project. So when your roof goes, not to replace the roof, but to replace do the architectural work and the other things that you need to do in order to get a cost for your roof. Mm -hmm. um, R &D. Well, I think that's what we can, that's all we can use the funds for now because there aren't a lot of funds in there. Right. But the idea was that both communities that were in agreement that the what they didn't want was the, the building to go to ruin mm -hmm. like the original high school correct um, and to make sure that the maintenance so depending on how we were going to fund that account the stabilization mm -hmm. fund would determine what kind of things we could do so if it was like a boiler or a major expense that the msba wouldn't be involved in it would be determined based mm -hmm. off of whatever the definition of that stabilization fund account would be i think you you speak to the point that my recollection is, yes, for instance, a boiler went down, but you've accumulated half a million dollars in that fund. By gosh, you can now go out and buy that boiler right away, rather than going to the town and saying, we need a town meeting, we need to appropriate, and the building's running cold for four months before that's done. You make a good point, yes, but we're not funded at that level right now. Mm -hmm. Really, the level we have right now doesn't give us that flexibility sure. to take care of those things. But I do think... Maybe it was, maybe it was a pipe dream. 
but the thought was that there would be a fund available so that you wouldn't have huge capital things like at the old school. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, all the windows in the second floor are shot. There's a roof leak in the third floor, which I think we went through at one point. Mm -hmm. um, and we'd had the flexibility because the school committee would have a fund targeted directly for that type of repair. It's unfortunate that there isn't that kind of money right now. But for the commitment to maintain, yeah, to make sure right. work hard, they're committed right. to maintain the building. And, and I think our our new administrative staff is willing to, you know, be those that are in front of you now are willing mm -hmm. to look at that and try to understand how we can try to uphold that commitment sure. and what what the vehicle to do that is. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, both of these gentlemen to my right were not here for any of that span of time. Sure. And so Quite now they're job. both getting. Mm -hmm their feet wet and getting right into the water mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. figure out how they can help solve the problem. Right. I think we understand that. We respect that too, you know, right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you're just diving in like you're saying. <laughs> in your conversations with advisory last week, did they give you an idea of what the top, top number might be from Hamden for the assessment? No, no. they said okay. that if we, if there was, they would be able to suffice to whatever Wilbraham could fund. They figured that Wilbraham wouldn't be able to fund the full amount, right. mm -hmm. but they we have funds that would be allow us to pay our portion. Um, so they looked at right now the number 441. Pretty aware that that's probably not going to be the final number. Mm -hmm. And if you're coming down, they felt that there was capacity within our levy limit that we can take care of. Mm -hmm. I would say that's a pretty fair assessment based on what we've seen come through for, mm -hmm. you know, we want to be good partners, but we want to be good financial partners as well. Mm -hmm. We have another, any more questions on the budget or can we go on to? Okay. Eight. Just 474. Hmm? 441. Oh yeah, and those were those were conservative numbers. Not to speak for Aaron, but he did say that. Page ten. <laughs> the, the assessment numbers. So, mm -hmm. elephant in the room. We got this building over on Wolverham Road. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? So. As you know, there's a, a planning committee that's looking at building usage right now. Mm -hmm. It's actually scheduled to meet tomorrow night. Um, Weather permitting. Right. Well, it'll meet. It'll probably meet virtually, even if it's not as you don't not happening you lose power. in person. <laughs> um, at the last meeting, uh, I was asked to look at five different scenarios. One is what could be done with um, building utilization without changing the regional agreement, what could be done with building utilization if we changed, if we regionalized 8 through 12, if we regionalized 7 through 12, if we regionalized 6 through 12, and if we regionalized 5 through 12. So there are a number of different options that are available. Um, obviously, the more you regionalize, the more options you have on the table. Um, there are I think at the time of that meeting last week, I think we had 136 different um, district configurations. <laughs> um, that was without looking at you know any constraints on the regional agreement. However, considering just those five scenarios, I think narrows it down to about 16 different scenarios. Yeah, I think we got it down to 35 last week or 32, and now you got it down to 16. Yeah. So I would say you know under We're getting there. Yeah. I would say that probably under 14 of the 16 scenarios, the building wouldn't be used. Um, however, I think the planning committee needs to have a discussion about the different scenarios and then the school committee would have to have a chance to take a look. 14 out of 16, it would not be used or would be used? Wouldn't be used by the district. Correct. 14 out of 16? Yeah. So what would, if you took Choices, do you have a thought what would happen to the building? In, in the event that we didn't need it? If you took choices one through 14, which didn't include using that building, yeah. what was your thought about 
status of the building? Well, or you're not that far. I, I would say that we're not that far yet. Um, you know, I would say looking at budget numbers like this, you know, I'd I'd rat, if we didn't need the building, I would prefer some kind of an outcome that did, helped us to reduce some costs associated with the building. But again, that really is a discussion for the school committee. That's not within my authority to say for myself. Mm -hmm. Not to get into your knickers, do some of the plans you're looking at include um, redistricting, so to speak? One plan I had offered back in 16 during the middle school task force thing was talking about treating the two middle schools as neighborhood schools and possibly a north middle school and a south middle school and in an enrollment line change of say Tinkham Road or something like that. Is that one of those things that's on the table and relieving some of the, perhaps the, I want to say some of the stress on Wolverham Middle, if you will. So uh, we do look at uh, redistricting a number of different ways. We look at creating neighborhood schools in a number of different ways. I uh, and Maybe the, the best thing to do would be to share you the memo after the planning committee has an opportunity to take a look at it and review mm -hmm. it. I don't see a scenario where we would have two middle schools because I don't think you have um, a need for two middle schools with the capacity both buildings have. We do have um, a problem that Wolverham Middle School is overcrowded at, at this time, but um, in, in the scenarios we've been looking at, I don't think the way to resolve that is by creating two middle schools. Mm -hmm. A lot of, just to be completely transparent, a lot of the um, solutions we're looking at would help to relieve the overcrowding by moving the eighth grade out of the middle school. Well, you could build a new middle school next to Minichog. Is that on the plan? No. One of them? That's no, not one of them? if you recall, I think when that discussion came about potentially getting a new middle school 2016 mm -hmm. or whatever, the MSBA told us we had plenty of buildings. We just had to figure out the configuration mm -hmm. that it didn't warrant them coming in and helping us build a brand new building. It'd be tough for them to partner in that yeah. situation. But when you see so many other regions doing campuses like that, it's hard to argue against it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think currently we're just looking at um, the utilization with the buildings that we currently sure. have to see what would work best. Okay. Well, I only ask because obviously also on our agenda is what we're doing with this building here. Mm -hmm. It has been bandied about. Is Thornton Burgess an appropriate place to house a town hall configuration? Mm -hmm. But we really don't want to hamstring you on what you need to do. It's built as a school. Is it in your mix? It's obviously under your control during the lease. So to try and get a sense of how it factors into your plans for the future, that's important to us. I think it's getting a little bit out of their jurisdiction right now. Right. You know, our capital needs for it is has nothing to do with what they're trying to do with the school system. Other than that we have a lease agreement with you until I think 2030. 2035. 2035. Right. Yeah. But as John said, if many of the plans do not incorporate the use of a building, I'm sure the budget would not, you'd care to keep funding taking care of it when you're not using it either. So. Correct. And that's also been a conversation we've had at the finance operations sub side of the meeting is it wouldn't necessarily be a cost savings to not utilize the building, but it would be more of a reallocation of those funds. Mm -hmm. And obviously we would, as um, members and good standing citizens, sure. if there was a decision that we weren't going to utilize the building, you guys would be the first to know. Right. I don't think that that's even something that's on, like, I know that there's, it's been floated, different people. I know Bill's often said about moving seventh and eighth grade um, to the high school or even just eighth grade of the high school, there's nothing happening. There's no formal plans. If that were to happen, these two fine gentlemen would come and sit before you, I would think, sure. and provide you with the ability to ask questions. Right. And, and give you that information. Correct. Not to speak for you, but I did. That's fine. I know you're all, all about the budget, Aaron. That dollar a year does make a difference, I'm sure, yes, every time. Yes. <laughs> yes. Writing that check is hard. It's not a painful writing. We haven't seen it yet this year. Oh, by the way, yeah. I'll get off that. Let me, it's in my car. Yeah, I'm sure. My wallet at home. Oh. All right. 
Any more questions for these fine people? I do have one. I was listening to that finance meeting earlier, and I, I, I kind of got in the middle of it, and I heard some talks about um, cutting programming. And I don't know where it went from there, because I didn't hear the whole conversation. Um, and I know that there's a, a question of funding. Are we looking at program cutting, or is, is that not an option, or is it considered? So what I, what I would say is, um, we're looking right now um, at about a million dollar projected gap from what we need for not even a level service budget. Um, one thing I'll correct in this presentation, it said that th this budget we're proposing would reduce three and a half positions. It's actually four and a half positions. So there's some reductions included within it. Mm -hmm. Those are because those are ESSER funded positions and they're planned to go away. Mm -hmm. um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking at some additional efficiencies in transportation by potentially going to a three-tier model. Mm -hmm. That might get us $200,000 worth of savings, so that still leaves an $800,000 gap. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I can't imagine any scenario um, where we're able to, to make up an $800,000 gap without doing reductions to staff. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we'll be looking at um, tomorrow with our administrative team is finalizing what the, that scenario could look like should it come to, to pass. And I believe that Thursday school committee meeting will be able to share some more detail about what that might mean. However, we <laughs> are very hopeful that it's not going to be that. I mean, we're thinking of that as the worst case scenario at this point. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that there'll be some flexibility and some more funding so that we can avoid um, making the types of cuts that we'll be talking about Thursday night. Yeah, my concern is, after being on the strategic planning committee and going through, there was a lot of push and a lot of feedback about, you know, arts and, you know, education for music and, you know, related things that were considered, you know, those related arts and whatnot. Um, you know, with any budget cuts, everybody always looks at those things for cutting first. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just, I'm concerned because I have two children who love the arts, love the music, and as now they can only take them six months out of the year, you know, half the, half the school year they're doing one, half the school year they're doing the other in elementary, which you know, they would rather be doing it, you know, full time, but so that's just my soapbox right there. You're preaching to the choir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Is there anything that you need from Michelle and I? Because you do know that this is my last term on the school committee. So I don't know who you've been looking for to replace my oh, that, was your, that was your job. That is your no, job. No, it's yeah. not my job. <laughs> I wasn't recruited to do it. I volunteered to do it. But, you know, um, I'm hoping that maybe they'll some, I don't know that anybody's pulled papers for it, so. So for public record right now, Maura is resigning, not resigning, but no longer I'm not continuing on, not run, running again. So no. we, we have a spot that needs to be filled on the hand side of the school. Reaching out to all those parents out there with kids. Speaking a little louder into the microphone. <laughs> Come on, everybody should do it, it's fun. Right. And parents, uh, papers need to be returned by the end of this month, I believe. Yep. So, yeah. so I don't know what that will but, mean though if someone doesn't pull papers. Yeah. Um, but if there was the need for a temporary for just mm -hmm. next year, the more of the concern is as my employment changes, I need to be able to make myself flexible um, for as it's changing. A lot of people are relocating, and I need to be able to support that. And my hours are weird, so it's mm -hmm. I I take pride in participating in the school committee, and engrossing myself in all of the policy, all of the finance side, mm -hmm. to really give Hamden a voice. And Michelle does a fantastic job of being our chair. I mean, this is the first time in a long time that you've had the chair and the vice chair mm -hmm. from Hamden. Mm -hmm. um, but we both take this job very serious, uh, and I don't want to only show up for part of meetings and only partially be able to be there. If the commitment's there, the commitment's there, I just can't commit to the three-year term. I think we all appreciate both of you and mm -hmm. the work that you guys do put in on this, the school committee. So, I mean, it doesn't go unnoticed. And we do offer you our thanks. Seriously, things like this, and I've known many school committee members over the years from Hamden. Don can speak to this. Yeah, it's a thankless job. <laughs> thankless job, seriously, where people come up to you, why isn't my kid getting Spanish? Why isn't this happening? I think the only thing equating with that is probably being president of the Rec Association. <laughs> Why isn't my kids starting at second? But again, it is a thankless job. You just, you just deserve our thanks for 
sticking with it. Absolutely. You know, as long as you did, and more, and Michelle, same thing. You guys are being paid, so you don't really get. I mean, the even same you guys get paid more than we do. <laughs> yes, we not, do. <laughs> <laughs> That's not saying we're worth <laughs> every penny. <laughs> every penny. No, 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 no. That's like why we need that dollar, Aaron. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you all thank for you coming all. in. Thank, thank you for having us. See you tomorrow night. Have a great night. Okay. Virtual. Well, Virtual. Thursday, I'm sure it'll be a riveting conversation. Yeah. Will we be able to hear it? Yes, you should. Know, if you want to participate, YouTube. you'll have yeah, to participate on, on YouTube. We just can't participate on Six, YouTube. That's Six thirty. That's the one downside. So Bob has gone down to rep us at the uh, advisory meeting. Uh, let's, so let's. Do we want to wander down we there. Do we want to adjourn and just go down, or? Well, we're not going to adjourn. We're just going to walk down there. Yeah, it's not a journey. So basically, uh, we were supposed to meet with the advisory committee to go over our budgets at 6:30. Bob Markle went down to start. He's probably already on page five. Oh, we'll go down and correct any mistakes that he's made. Right. We'll be back. We'll be back. We'll be back. Oh. I was, I was I just made the suggestion to them, and they were going to forward it to you that um, we got to do something about the, the volume in here because we couldn't hear. No, I know you can't hear it. Said, huh? Everyone says the same thing every meeting. Well, then let's let's do something. You, you're the technology person. Can you do something? You know how to do it? Did you order that cable? Just buy a cable. For <laughs> get the cable right now. Get online and get the cable. <laughs> and then you just attach it, and it works. It solves the problem. In theory. Oh yeah, that's and cool. Then, then you can just hear it all. Now, I wonder if they can hear you at home. Can they hear you at home? They can hear us at home. Because the other one, they couldn't. The last, the, yeah. well, the last oh, meeting I went terrible. to with you, they it's couldn't terrible. hear us at home. They said. You have to be like this. Hello, darling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clean <laughs> the batteries, and then ah. when the batteries get weak, they stop working. That's it. You got it. Well, they turn them off.
No, they didn't. They just said they moved it. From side to side. Right. 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 Okay, I'm not sure what Bob is. Uh, so Bob has met with the advisory, shared our budgets with them. He'll report on that. Quickly, uh, selectman reports. Give a quick report from the Council on Aging, sorry, Senior Center uh, Building Committee. We met today, the last meeting, the board wanted to recommend to the selectmen that they would prefer that they not pursue um, re relocating a library over there or any other um, public building. They feel that the space is very limited for any addition other than senior center addition. And without an expansion of the parking lot, there would be no additional room. And that's, that's from them. Uh, there was also a motion today to, and I'll read the text of the motion that Becky sent. Da, 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 da. After review of the feasibility study and review of future needs of the senior center, we proceed to go into the second phase of scope of services for a more detailed analysis of the wants and needs of the senior center. And that was, uh, uh, motion by Don, seconded by Rita. All in favor except uh, Dwayne was opposed. <coughs> so basically what we're saying is uh, kick it back to selectmen. They're ready to go to the next phase, which is putting out, basically uh, put the verbiage together for a request for proposal to look at different options for expansion. That will take a little money However, probably not the sum that was referenced before, which typically is 10% of the building cost. This is something that may be covered in the five to 10 range. Um, if you recall, the committee came back to the selectmen a, a couple of months ago looking for $5,000 to look at reflagging the wetlands, which the board agreed to at that time, taking out, I think, uh, selectmen expenses. Fortunately, through the donation of a couple of uh, participants, that money was not needed. So we would be looking for basically retasking that money towards this need. So we're looking for direction from the Board of Selectmen. When I say we, I'm the ex officio member to the Senior Center Building Committee. So at this point, uh, that committee is looking for probably five, not to exceed 10, thousand dollars to draft what is needed for firms to come forward and bring plans. Request for is it R RFP or RF? RQ. RFP at this RFP. point. RFP. 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 Yeah. RFP. Yeah. Hold on that quote per se. In yeah. uh, the selectman's expense? Out of the selectman's expense? Right, which I still think is funded in the 12 range. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Cliff is actually on that committee as well, and he said there would be no issue. Uh, with the appropriateness or finding the funds needed. But it's at this point, this, this committee has been meeting for a while and it's time to fish or cut bait here. You know, either we push forward, find if it's feasible, if it's able to be done or not and go forward and kick it back. We have a lot of projects in front of us, whether it's the town hall usage, town hall renovation, fire station, which is anywhere from Plan A to Plan Z at this point, Don. Might even be a couple of letters <laughs> past that, double A. So we can't keep them all up, in, all these balls up in the air. We have to, you know, get one rolling. Uh, so moved. To use, uh, how much is it? Not to exceed five to 10. 10 not, to, not to exceed 10. Not Basically, to the five was returned because okay, we never did the other part. Okay, not to exceed $10,000 for the uh, development, development or re request for a proposal from the selectman's expense. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It's not anticipated it's going to be that much because we have the draft of several other ones 
at this point. So, and we have people like Gary Weiner, yeah. pretty familiar with that type of thing, working with Bob as well. No, Wilbraham's cranking it along on their senior center. It, it, it's funny. We looked at their document, which dates from 2014. So that was nine years ago before they actually broke Is, is there any thought that it's going to pull away from our senior center? That's been a conversation for pretty much at every meeting. And it's amazing the, the documentation and the data that the staff there has that the participant level is not Wilbraham. It's our biggest group, actually comes from East Long Meadow and Springfield. Wilbraham is, I think, third. Will Springfield then, go to Wilbraham afterward? Let's, if they're coming down, I'm tough coming, to, why not? Tough to say. You look at Ludlow, for instance, that has a pretty nice program, and people from Ludlow come to Hamden hmm. because they like ours better. It's about staffing. It's not about just, you know, you can have a nice star, a store, but if the service people aren't great, you're not going back to that store. So. There is a uh, St. Patrick's Day luncheon on Wednesday, if you'd like to go. Corned beef, I'm told. Corned beef. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Which I will not the, be there was for. the salt content of the corned mm -hmm. beef? Yeah, <laughs> Probably pretty low. I would think low sodium, I'm sure. Oh, my gosh. Um, so that's from the Senior Center part. The planning board, um, two things. They have the bylaw pretty well put together for the accessory apartment which we're referring to as the in-law apartment. Uh, that's something I think I and other people have championed for a number of years that there's a need for that type of thing in town. We all know people who have an in-law that may, for whatever circumstance has to come and live at home and to have the ability to build that properly under building code and have the value in your home is something that's sorely needed. So that's coming forward. Um, they use Wilbraham's as the model. They are having a public hearing on that the, on the 29th, I believe. Yep, 29th, and then they'll be coming to the accessory, or sorry, the um, advisory meeting on the 10th of April, and then to ours. Next would be the master plan committee. So they interviewed three firms last Wednesday. Uh, they're going to do some follow-up on the, obviously, the references, things like that, and come back with a recommendation at their next meeting next Wednesday. At this point, I think you're aware that uh, Bob has a grant for 75000 Only one firm was at that number or below, and I think it's the thought of the committee they may be able to go back into negotiations and see if they can change the scope of work to meet what him the needs and also inside the money. Uh, since this is engineering services, it's actually not covered by 30B or constrained by 30B. And that's where I am. It's all quiet. Hmm? Water Commission got postponed for tomorrow. So we're going to meet next month now. Yeah. What's your... you? Um, you're collecting some numbers together for a possible ARPA submittal at this point? For? The water district. Not at the moment. We're, well, we're, we're sending out, Bob sent out three bids, or sent out the, the request for bids to three firms today. So we're going to get that back. Mm -hmm. But um, that could be for ARPA funds. Not, right. Yeah. Not, I said ARPA. Did you say ARPA? I'm yeah. sorry. I, I thought okay. you said we're putting together a warrant. No, no, no. So just to get a sense of, I know you talked before that potentially the upgrades to the, the pump house pump house could be considerable. Yeah, they, they've been after, well, not they, um, our water operator has been after us for probably two years now to look into upgrading the in-ground storage tank mm -hmm. because DEP is eventually going to want to phase those out. Sure. So this might be the opportunity now to, you know, take that 22-year building and fix it. Yeah. If you go above ground, this is just a question in my mind, is there a freezing potential or because the water is always mixing and be, flowing, it's... Yeah, it's, it's always moving, and I believe right. it would be in the building, but above ground. Okay. So you would have a building still right. with the storage tanks. 
In the tank, I thought you talked about, so is this like the size of a swimming pool, basically, or a little smaller? Or, I mean, your typical 27 swimming pool is like 25,000 gallons. Yeah, I, I don't remember offhand what um, the water operator was recommending, mm -hmm. but it was it was two tanks, okay, two above-ground tanks. It would pretty much be in the same footprint as it is now, mm -hmm. but most of the footprint now is underground. Okay. Do we have a constraint, and I haven't seen that that agreement in 20 years, do we have a constraint on the amount of room that we can use with Audubon? I do not know that. I have not seen that either. I, I don't even think we know where the agreement is because every time we've <laughs> looked for it, we don't see it. Wow. Um, it was just kind of a, hey, we'll do this, and you know, you're okay over there from what I was told. Wow. So that it's, 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 yeah. No. But that's um, you know, all part of you know the scope of work will be for the, the contractor to do all the environmental needs with Audubon over there. Okay. Right, so there's really no need for, assuming that everything's inside the ARPA number, which is around 600, there's really not gonna be a need for any town meeting work. This is all water commission work or selectman work at this point. Yeah, and I don't think I have to go to any meeting. We're not increasing the size of the district. If we can fund it with ARPA, and I think Bob applied for some other additional grants, the, mm. the, the one-stop grant, I believe. All right. So, but that's, you know, not yet. You know, show me the money as well. Oh, yeah. Have we seen any money from the state lately? Yeah. yeah. You? You got the money from the state? I got my tax refund. <laughs> <laughs> got a good accountant. It must be. Congratulations. <laughs> Separate bank accounts. I know you told me yes, that already. Oh, yeah. Planning committee tomorrow night, school building utilization. You heard what the superintendent said, so. All right. Okay. That's it. Pam, mm -hmm. hey, I have a uh, question quick. for you on the budget. The pro property and liability, would you find out if that 134485 is, if that's the entire, if we paid the bill already for the year? Because if that's the case, and if we're going up 10%, we can still do this number here. Yeah, but I mean, did we transfer more in? I mean, it sounds like appropriated 125 and paid 135. Well, we appropriated one, uh, 150. We appropriated 150. Well, this expenditure, no, I'm saying, so that was, so last year, we went over by 10. So we went up this year, and we're still, we're still 10 short, even after we put more in, so. That was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the Chubb. Chubb is under there as well, and I know they went up. Yeah. Mm hmm Okay. I put on the agenda ongoing projects, and quickly before that, we had correspondence. Don was good enough to share with us a, uh, a ruling from the state about public input and stuff. I bounced that by the town attorney who actually wrote a friend of the court for that very case from the Massachusetts Lawyers Association. Uh, the good thing is Great. that is only um, if you have public comment in your meeting. That's not during any other regular part of the meeting. And which is a long-standing thing from the former chair. We don't allow public comment no. unless recognized by the chair. Right. So this might happen. Uh, who typically, the school committee has a public comment period, don't they? School committee does, yeah. Yeah. So basically it was a letter saying that you really can't control what people might say in a meeting if they're allowed to speak. You would hope for civility and decorum, but you can't require it. I would say in my years of service here and everybody else, I have not, I cannot recall anybody really losing control during a meeting in town, Don. To any, to any, <laughs> other than the to elected, the, to the extent, elected officials. No. Yeah, but to the extent yeah, as no, mentioned no, in no. that yeah, article, no, no, no nothing no, like no, that. No, no, no. And I've seen other towns online. And We've had some pretty good discussions at town meetings and other meetings too that, you know. But, but, for the most yeah. part, respectful. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. But when I, the only thing I can have to say about that ruling is this, that it's going to do two things. It's going to discourage 
boards from having a public comment. Mm -hmm. So it's going to quell the free speech. And secondly of all, it's going to discourage people from seeking office mm -hmm. if some guy can stand up and call you any name in the book. Sure. You know? Yep. So anyhow, but it's the Supreme Court. So here we go. Yeah. Supreme. Mass court. State to just straight. Right. Those guys. Yeah, state Those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, let's see. So townhouse, I throw this out there quickly. Where do we stand? What should, what, where do we stand for you guys think? I haven't really looked it over. I mean, I, I, I just saw $2 million and I thought, okay, 2 million plus the senior center plus the fire station. <laughs> but, but again, that 2 million didn't come up with a plan. Too, yeah, yeah. That was the low number. Too. The low number. Yeah. But didn't come up with a plan for the library. No. So two million plus what are we build another library building, which has got to be six, $8 million. Yeah. So that, I, I, and I think Craig has made this point before. I'm not sure if the right message is getting to, because again, did I see a real good discussion of the bones of the building? You know, where would HVAC be, you know? Well, the, the immediate needs were, I think, covered in that report where it says yeah. immediately needs to fix a lot of the electrical and environmental. Mm -hmm. I think so. Right. Yeah. Um, and fire department, uh, the meeting, which none of you will be able to watch because I guess we didn't record it. I guess the audio recording of the meeting, yeah, the online thing is a minute and a half. So I thought there were some, some decent comments here, but obviously our concern is that, you know, between the two meetings, you know, we saw many of the same people at both meetings, right. but in terms of participation by the town, it's a low number. And we're talking a, a huge potential anywhere from, I think the lowest Mitchell number was what, 1.2 yep. up to 17, yeah, yeah. right? So yes, it's the job of the selectmen to, to set the goals, but we wanna make sure that everybody is engaged in the process. And I'm concerned that we're not getting the full buy-in that, that we need for you know, obviously, people see things go well. I mentioned at the Senior Center Building Committee meeting that you look at the expansion of the highway department and 90% of the people think the highway department does a great job because the roads are plowed and they're fixed and if they needed a couple more bays, well, they must need them because they do a good job. And they're not really into the the number of bricks or number of two by fours it was needed to get the job done. <laughs> right. So when they ask for a truck, they must need it. So I don't know how we're going to get more direction. I think Don, you've mentioned before, we need to get Jeff here and really have him in front of yeah. us and talk about what's the next step. We do. Right. Jeff, the uh, Hectron, Craig. Hectron. Yep. Hopefully, McElberry. hopefully for next week it'd be great if he's available. I know he, yeah. even if he has to zoom in, I think we need to talk yeah, to him. The twentieth, right? Um, Bob's report. Sidewalks, uh, really nothing new on that. If Bob hasn't got a check from the state, we're not doing anything. No, nope. he doesn't. Not that I know of. No, we're not doing anything. <laughs> it's funny how it, here we talk about a message. Don Collins is on the senior center building committee, and he was concerned about that sidewalk going in front of his house. And I said, Don, Wait, it's never going... it's never been going down that way. Well, I thought it was. So either we're not doing a good job of getting our message <laughs> out, right? Because it's never been discussed going. I think it was east pretty, pretty apparent what we were talking about. Right. Extending, extending it extending. to know, the one across the street. I yeah. know. <laughs> so that's that's a bit of a concern. What's well, already here plus yeah. it, right. down Main to the other end. I thought advisory quit. They, I'm sorry. I thought they adjourned. They That's did. my question. <laughs> he probably thinks we adjourned. A motion to adjourn? Well, well, let's read his report. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, tell us what's happening with broadband. I don't have anything to update. Nothing new. Nothing new. Well, what's the current, so people know, the current thing is 
doing agreements and stuff like that. And yeah, it's they're a poll petitions. There's what's going through now. We finally mm -hmm. got the agreements signed off with Verizon, right? Mm -hmm. Last week. Okay. Yeah. You are you are off the. Yeah. Shout, scream. Yeah. And so all this so far is covered. All all of this is covered under the uh, grant we had received. So okay. yeah, nothing's nothing's expended past that grant. Um, you know, after the poll petitions are done, then we're going to have that cost of what it's going to do for the make ready. And mm -hmm. at that point, we'll need to figure out funding. Okay. So we're still waiting on them to do the agreements, all agreements, the licensing, mm -hmm. so we know where we stand mm -hmm. for the next step. We're not at that phase yet. And if I remember correctly, you were talking, was anywhere from six to eight different, let's say, regions inside the town that get, is that part of the build out process? Well, yeah, th those are just the zones, you know, the zones. The, the zones that they would, you know, factor in, you know, they would obviously take the highest take rate zone first sure. because it'd be the most return of revenue to the mm -hmm. town. But we won't know, even know that until we get to the next phase. Okay. I do see, you saw number eight on Bob's list. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, I think we pretty much covered everything and that's on Bob's report anyhow. MVP, I just, I, the rain garden, I. Okay, well, you don't have a, you don't have a mic over there. Yeah, great. Okay, again, I'm looking for suggestions from both the gentlemen for next week's agenda. We've got to really kick some of these, get some of these balls out of the air. Oh, well, we see we got the fire department guy on. Oh, okay, that's good. Right. Uh, I really like a little more flushing out on number eight there. Uh, that, that would be a. Mm -hmm. And we got to decide on in or out on early voting and mail voting. Well, we don't have to. So if we keep the status quo right now, we don't have to do anything. So, which is well, we haven't re decided Eva, that yet. <laughs> well, Eva has recommended that we not do early voting, and that requires no action from the board. And, right. Okay, and she's okay with vote by mail because that's the same as absentee voting, and is no extra work from them. If, of course, they don't have a mailbox, but Craig is on top of that. Mailbox. <laughs> Craig has reported that the. Uh, the handle the broke on the, what's that? From the post office, the handle broke. I asked today when I was down there and they said the handle broke in the mailbox. They've covered it and they're deciding whether they're gonna replace it or remove it. I don't know if they can remove it though. I think they have to have I some think, drop. Yeah, you would think so. so. <laughs> I think uh, Thad just volunteered. Thank I you, I think Thad. if you read the, the actual USPS website, they're talking about changing out all their mailboxes to thin slot boxes yeah, instead they have of having those a, in yeah. Yeah. But you know. It's a federal program, so it's probably well, maybe they could move here. the one that's actually up the town hall. They could borrow that one if they'd like. So, um, so back to your thing, Don. Uh, does the board want to concur then with the uh, re recommendation of the town yeah, clerk? I don't, I don't, we, we probably should, right? I mean, just no. She she's doing it, not us. So, yeah. so we concur that there will be no early voting, and that uh, vote by mail is. We're fine with that neither of which requires any public Official notice election, or anything right, like that. Right, right. So moved. Okay. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. So Pam, you'll pass that back to Eva, please. She should be in tomorrow. Okay, is there any other items to come before the board? What are we doing on the, are we having the hearing on, that's 27th though. Yeah, I saw an email from you, Pam, that I talked to Wendell today and he said he was all set. Okay. Right, that Finn had signed off and yeah. So it's the same space, and according to Wendell, again, they they cut down the numbers inside, so their original permitted number is still the same. All right. Well, are they going to continue that for a permit? Because they want a permanent outdoor, right?
No, that would be our question. Yeah, but, but, so the, but I guess that's the question. If the occupancy is cut down on the inside for the outside, mm -hmm. so the permit stays the same, but what happens is the occupancy isn't cut down on the inside. Yeah. I don't know that we ever gone back Would into the planning me. board have to reapprove that. No, I think Don is saying, you know, what if they actually don't? Yeah, if they have 50, I guess my point is this, if they if they're if their occupancy I just I don't know what their numbers are. Well, let's say their occupancy permit is 100 right now. Mm -hmm. And they're going to knock it down to 60 inside so they can have 40 outside for the right. summer. Mm -hmm. That's still 100. But how do we know they're not going to have 100 inside? Yeah. But, or but, how do you go back? If but how's that true of any, I mean, do we well, walk you know, over I mean, the, the geos I mean, and the, check, or do you walk to Castellan I mean, they would have to, check? I mean, you know, uh, yeah. I, and do you have to go, can you go back? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, if you, so I don't know. Mm. Well, fortunately, this is a, you know, so the manager has to come to our meeting plus the attorney. So oh. these are valid questions at that time. And actually, it's a good question for either Wendell or who does that type of inspection That's on right. it. You know, all of our places that have capacity limits, do you check them? Yeah. You know, take your budget, take your wife out the dinner. <laughs> and if they're going, and if, and, and, if they're gonna, and if they're going to do a, if they don't want this as a permanent outdoor thing, mm -hmm. do we need at some mm -hmm. point to create some kind of standard regulation for everybody you know if geos wants to do it permanently at some point if if i think if, yeah they drop theirs i'm not if, quite if, sure about uh, mountain view with that tent in back you know in, in uh, uh casabella the rear mm -hmm. Right, but not for alcohol. So I was going to yeah. say, if they serve alcohol, it's a whole different thing. That's all, yep. yep. Okay. All right. all right, let's stay on top of that. So they think that'll be the 27th, or are they moving in a, kick a little longer? All right. Well, they got to the do, right. do it right. The other wrinkle is that the legislature, both the House and the Senate, have passed a bill extending the COVID one, like it is now, for, for another year, right? And this this week they're gonna allegedly this week they're going to uh, the in in the House one it doesn't allow alcohol in the Senate one they're gonna reconcile it this week and the governor will probably sign it before April first so then the then the temporary one will be back in effect. Mm -hmm. They also so extended no the point. well they also extended the Zoom regulations for right, meetings right. too so which meeting was going to expire. They weren't doing that for two years I thought yeah. to twenty five right so. That should be signed next week, this week or next week. Say before They're signing all that thing, but they can't sign the check to give us the money no. for the sidewalks? No, no. They ran out of ink when it comes to that. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, because we want to get that bill passed on. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we used to do a selectman's newsletter back in the yeah. day. Maybe that's something. Maybe we got to get back out. to that. Every department would kick a little thing. I'd print them over at the office. Yeah. We'd mail out 2500 or, or just, you used to attach them to the, the senior to the, to the scribe as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, you're you're a rookie. All right. Apparently, I'll, I'll print some old copies for you. We all set. Heck, I used to do the scribe in my kitchen back in the day. Motion to adjourn. So we'll uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.